Well, um, I think initially at the early stages of the pandemic, um, we saw kind of a natural reaction from a lot of countries where they tended to close their borders and uh, stop interactions with other countries. Um, in some cases, you saw uh, trade was halted or perhaps even just mail between countries, regular mail has, has been interrupted. So um, I think the reaction to kind of go into a cocoon to try and um, protect themselves uh, was, was one reaction. Um, and you, we also saw the U.S. withdrawal from the WTO, which is a major institution for dealing with the pandemic. So um, that probably wasn't a very encouraging sign for multilateralism either or cooperation, but um, I think uh, one, one positive note that we could look at is the COVAX uh, project um, that was initiated by the uh, WTO and it's called the CEPI, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, and uh, Gavi, which is also called the Vaccine Alliance. Um, and they gathered uh, governments, global health organizations, manufacturers, scientists, and the private sector in an effort to try and speed up, accelerate um, vaccine, um, and also to try and find a candidate vaccine that would allow them to distribute uh, two billion doses to countries, um, their frontline health workers, and uh, vulnerable people around the world especially um, in countries where perhaps they don't have the public health infrastructure to research and develop their own vaccine. So I think when you see um, government and the private sector come together like that, uh, there are some discouraging or discouraging, encouraging signs. So um, there's the dark side of domestic politics where we have to protect our own people, but we've also seen some cooperation. I think the important thing is for governments to try and agree on the issues that they want to talk about. Yeah. And even, even with COVID, I, I don't think we've seen a lot of, of agreement between countries. Definitely um, the world recognizes COVID as a threat, but I, I think the nature of COVID is such that once we have a vaccine or we've come up with, with uh, some therapeutics that allow us to deal with it and it's not as dangerous to uh, the, the, the at-risk groups, that um, it will no longer be an issue that motivates countries to come together. So I think the issue itself that will bring countries together has to be something that requires a, a long-term uh, vision and, and uh, something that all countries agree that it, is, it requires their cooperation. Um, so the, the obvious one that a lot of people have been bringing up is obviously climate change. Um, we tend, for, for decades, we've kind of said, oh, well, yes, it could, we agree that you know, climate change is, is an issue, but that's not our issue, that's tomorrow's issue. But tomorrow is coming very quickly, and I think that will be the issue that will bring governments together. I don't know how they will reinvent multilateralism. I think they'll probably just try and build on what they have already done. And I think if you look at most international cooperation and multilateralism, that it tends to follow that. It starts out with a tiny step, and then with that as a foundation, it builds upon that. So. Um, I think the issue when we, we talk about national governments cooperating with each other is they can't just focus on one issue. If the governments of, of the world could focus on climate change and that was the only issue they had to deal with, then they could probably come up with a solution to it quite easily. But they have to worry about their national economies. Um, they have to worry if they are from a democratic country, they have to worry about how their, their constituents feel about what steps they're taking. Um, and there, it's, it's such a 
difficult task for a government of a country to look at one issue and say, okay, we're only going to focus on one issue and no other issue matters. So um, for that reason, I think governments are very important. Obviously, they're the ultimate arbiters of whether or not there is cooperation. But um, I, I think that if we look at which, which parts or, or what levels there are, what levels in society are able to cooperate most easily. Um, definitely the private sector. I think most companies have a long-term vision for profitability and sustaining their business. So they're able to find opportunities and partners in other countries and, and work for like win-win cooperation. Whereas um, if we're talking about climate change and for example, if we tell China you're not allowed to use coal-fired uh, coal uh, electricity generation anymore, that's a lose for them and it's, a, it's hard for them to sell it. Obviously they don't have to sell it to voters but um, they still have to look at their national interest and it, it comes into conflict with things like their energy security policy which uh, makes it difficult for them to just agree to address climate change all at, all at once. Whereas companies when they're only thinking about the profit motive and how their businesses can come together and, and, and do, do business, uh, I, I think it's easier for them to do. Um, also, uh, NGOs, because most NGOs are founded on the idea of dealing with one issue area, um, as I said earlier, for a government, because they're focused on the broad picture, it's hard for them to forget everything else and only deal with one area, whereas an NGO usually exists because of that one area. So they're able to try and come up with ways to cooperate with each other. The problem is a lot of times they don't have a lot of influence on the policy making um, of a national government. So I, I guess if I had to, uh, if I had to <laughs> try and encapsulate what I, what I just said, governments are important. And, uh, but I, I think uh, probably a partnership with uh, NGOs and, and perhaps private um, companies or the private sector uh, may be a more effective way of uh, achieving some sort of cooperation. So I have been in Korea for about 18 years. And um, I've, I've taken, I did my PhD here in Korea. And um, one of my professors at Yonsei University was Professor uh, Chong In Moon, who is a, one of the main speakers yeah. here. He's much more important than me, so. <laughs> um, but I took um, two of his classes on Northeast Asian international relations and one on Northeast Asian regionalism. And, um, when, when I was told that I would be coming and giving a presentation on this topic, I was kind of taken aback because in his classes, we discussed how almost from any theoretical lens of international politics, cooperation in Northeast Asia is, there's a lot of pessimism about it. Um, there, are, there are so many, so many issues um, that are outstanding that uh, you just, it, it's hard to ignore. And one of the things that I always got, uh, when, whenever we got into a discussion of Northeast Asia, is that there is no EU. There is no regional organization. Um, and when, when you hear the pessimism and you hear there is no EU, um, you know, a, a lot of people would just say, oh, well, it's impossible because of the issues that, that Northeast Asian countries have with each other. But I think, as I said earlier, um, the important thing is, is for countries to select an issue that they need to cooperate on, that they cannot resolve on their own through their own government's efforts or the efforts of private citizens. So the the important thing that, that I, would, I would say is that um, if we, we look at cooperation in Northeast Asia, um, we have to try and get past the issues of, of 
the colonial experience. Obviously, it was, it was not a good thing. Nobody would agree that, that colonizing another country is, is good, and countries should be sorry for, for doing that. Um, and if, if we look to perhaps China's case, the, the idea where countries came in and had spheres of influence, that was also a negative experience. We can look at World War II and, and the Korean War, where, where countries of Northeast Asia came into conflict with each other um, and, and people died. So those issues of history, obviously, we should not forget them. But if we want to build a future, we can't put them before the future. And I know that's, a, that's easier said than done, but I, I really think that, that that is something that is important and needs to be said. Um, in Northeast Asia, there's also territorial issues. There's the Kuril Northern Territories issue between Russia and Japan. There's the Dokdo issue, obviously. There's the Daewoo Sengaku issue between Japan and China. And even on the Korean Peninsula, North and South Korea, in their constitutions, it says that they own the entire peninsula. So there's an issue of sovereignty even on the Korean Peninsula. So um, all of these issues in mind, I remember it, again in Professor Moon's class, him talking about uh, Carl Deutsch. Carl Deutsch um, talked about uh, the Atlantic Alliance and how the, the, the countries, the NATO members, had a we feeling. But there is no we feeling in Northeast Asia. I don't see a lot of Koreans cheering for the Japanese soccer team in the World Cup. And it's probably the same in Japan, it's probably the same in China. So um, that said, all of those things are cause for pe pessimism. And if we leave it at that, yes, there can be no EU in Europe. But there can't be one now. That's what I would say. There can't be one right now. So the problem with thinking of the EU as the ideal is that the EU is a result of something that began after World War II. Rome was not built in a day. You have to start small. You can't have the EU tomorrow. If, if you took a time, but, but that makes sense, that's obvious. We shouldn't be pessimistic just because there are negative, negative problems now and, and there are issues between the countries now. If we start at a very basic level, choose an issue, and begin cooperation, we can build on that and eventually get to perhaps having a multilateral institution. Probably not the EU. The EU is founded on democratic principles. But Northeast Asia could easily have something like ASEAN and probably do it better. They have a lot more resources to develop. So I, I, think, I think there's cause for optimism. But uh, definitely this idea that, Korea, that Northeast Asia now cannot be EU now. That's true. But Northeast Asia now could be like the EU after World War II, where they see the merits of cooperation and just start with that first step.